Now ready to put the cylinder heads on. I have already pre-lubed up the bolts and the washers. If you don't know already, these ARP washers have a chamfer on one side that always goes up towards the bolt head. That is so that it has clearance in that radius area and you're not creating a stress riser when you torque them down because that can lead to potential failure. Got my head gasket out and trying to keep it as clean as possible. So I'm only touching the insides or the outsides and not putting my hands on the surfaces at all. To prepare the block and the cylinder head, just got some brake cleaner. I spray down a rag. And you're just going to run it over the deck surface. I just want to remove any oils or grease or in the case of the block here why we're not worried about that paint over spray from earlier is because now we can just scrub it a little bit just like this and the paint will come up and we just want to get everything wiped down so that we have a perfectly clean surface before the head gasket And literally that's all it takes there. I've already taken the paint off, flip it over, or the rig over to another spot that doesn't have paint residue on it then. We'll just give it one more wipe down to be sure. Now the rig can kind of end up with a few fuzzies on here, so you may want to just pick those off a little, but all in all, it's not going to cause much of a problem for anything because they're just tiny little fibers. But I like to make sure it's as clean as possible because the cleaner it is, the less likely you're to have any problems from dirt, debris, and anything like that. Oh. Alright, now that we've had, I mean, it doesn't take very long to dry, it's just very cleaner. Come grab my head gasket. Some head gaskets might have an up or a down. With an Oldsmobile, there isn't one way or the other because the head gasket is symmetrical. The reason why there might be an up and down depending on the engine is the head gasket will be controlling some of the coolant flow. On an Oldsmobile, that's uh, based on where the holes are drilled. To give you a quick visual of that, the fact that there's no holes here at the front of the block, but there is these two at the back promotes coolant flow at the back of the engine versus the front and that's what makes sure when it comes off the water pump in the front that it will flow evenly through the block up into the cylinder head then back to the front to go through the intake and then back to the radiator. Some head gaskets will have some holes open, some closed off. so. It, you gotta pay attention to whether or not the engine you have has one of those types. So we can set our head gasket down, make sure it's lined up with dowel pins, just push it on. And I just want to make a quick visual check and make sure that the head gasket is not hanging out into a cylinder, whether its bore size is too small or perhaps it was stamped incorrectly or you've got the wrong head gasket altogether. And this one looks good, not any problems. Now that we've got our clean cylinder head deck, same deal, we'll go right on with it. Kind of eyeball it, you want to try to get the dowels lined up right off the bat. There you go, you want to make sure you got positive engagement where I'm trying to twist this and it's not going to come off. I know that I have it on the dowels correctly. I got ARP lube on the bolt head to the washer, on the bottom of the washer, and on the base of the threads on every single one of these. So I'll just get them dropped in. I can use a speed wrench just to snug everything up before I start torquing. 
I'll still go through the torque pattern with it. I'm just going to run it down until it's hand tight. This is really a time saver over trying to do it with just a ratchet. I also don't want to run these down with an electric drill or anything like that and risk torquing it up in an uneven fashion before I can start torque wrenching it. We don't want to ruin that head, brand new head gasket right off the bat by getting it torqued weird and unevenly. Now everything's snug up, we can just go through the torque sequence and then we'll be ready to do the repeat the process with the other side. Since these head bolts are half inch, it's recommended to do a series of three steps all the way up to a hundred. So that's exactly how we'll do it. Remember to go through your torque sequence. If you don't have access to a torque sequence, typically it's starting at the center and then spiraling out. Some engines are pickier than that and the way they get torqued. But for the most part, that's how they, they run is just as an outward spiral. And we'll go through at the 100 setting a second time, just to be sure. And you just got ever so slight of a turn on those center two. And the rest of them seem to be staying put. That's the first side completed. All right, and that's both cylinder heads put on. Next we'll have to fit rocker arms. I'm pretty sure these studs are too long. They were just something I had for holding the guide plates in place for the time being. I have a new set of studs over here and the rocker arms. I doubt those push rods will work, so I'll have to figure out what push rods to run. But one more step of the way, I'll get these rocker studs swapped out and then start checking for push rod lengths and get the lifters put in. That way, all that stuff can be checked, push rods ordered, and continue on. Now I've got the studs swapped out. And an important thing to do here is to make sure that the rollers are lined up with the tips because the guide plates have some free movement. So what I'm looking to do, I just have some push rods stuck in here. They're not the right length, but they're long enough to do this job. So I'm letting them sit in the lifter and they're sitting in the rocker and we're just angling it around until I can have both rockers where during its slop from side to side in the guide which is what it will have while it's running we want the roller to stay completely contacted across the top of the valve because if it was for example like this we're losing contact patch there and it can cause premature wear and engine damage so Right there, I got a little bit of wiggle back and forth. The roller is going to stay in contact the entire time on both of them. Let's pull these off quick. I 
You just want to snug each stud because that'll minimize any twist that it might do. And then I can torque them. And we come back and just double check that everything stayed where I wanted it. And that's how you set that up. Now when we're checking for push rod length, we're looking for a length where the roller will have the least amount of travel forward and backwards as it go, you know, operates through lift. We don't want to have it swinging from one edge of the valve all the way to the other because that's putting a side load pushing back and forth on the valve stem and can lead to premature valve train wear, especially the guides. So we're going to be able to swap to a length checking push rod here or even if you got different ones of different solid lengths like I do. You can check, I know this one for a fact is too short because with that current valve on base circle, it's sitting pretty centered or even a little bit to that side of the valve, but we're too low down here where the rocker is actually contacting the edge of the stud. So it, it will need a, at least a little bit longer push rod to start with, but I can use this to get a baseline where as I turn it over, get a nut on here, we'll see how far it comes across. And if the slightly up in the lift looks good through the rest of the lift, then I know I just need to get a long enough push rod to make that sit correctly where it won't hit the bottom of the stud. Otherwise, I can switch to my length checking ones if I need something much longer than that so that I can kind of dial in where the roller contacts the valve at and then crank it through and let the rocker operate to make sure we can get as small of a wear pattern as possible. Now I can see during that travel it definitely rolled more out on the valve before it came back in. Now by making this push rod longer that will actually tip the valve starting position out further and when it switches direction to come back it should minimize that wear pattern. I can see based on the oil that it was about that wide for what that wear pattern is. So if we can narrow that up to half of that, it will be a good. As another example, this is another push rod I have that is significantly too long. As you can see, the rocker is already tilted down. So as I crank it around, you'll see almost all of the sweep is gonna be pulling back towards the intake. This is also far from the ideal stress carrying capabilities of the rocker arm where it's way past center that way. And it yields an even wider patch than with our too short of a push rod. So that's a good example of where too short, too long, you can induce a lot of additional wear into your valve train. Yes, it will work and it will run, but it's definitely, you're just causing more stress than you need to in an engine. So we want the right length push rod to minimize as much wear as possible. As you can see here, I've tested three different lengths of push rod to kind of bracket and show more a better example of what being too short, just right, and too long ends up looking like as far as its travel across the tip of that valve. As you can see with the eight and a half inch push rod, we still had a fairly wide, but not really too bad pattern on the tip of that valve all the way to the left. But compared to the 8600, it is nearly twice as wide. The 8600 in the green there is a pretty ideal length for the push rod. As you can see, it's also centered on the valve as well as being a narrow strip. 
With the 8700, while it is still a small pattern of travel across the valve, definitely not on center and therefore less ideal than the 8600. Now with an Oldsmobile, one of the things we need to address, especially in a high performance application, is the cam thrust coming forward in the block, which obviously the timing cover sits against here, and unlike a typical Chevrolet, Ford, or anything else like that, the timing cover is actually a flat plate across all of this, and then the water pump sits on top versus having a step in it. This makes it a, quite a bit easier for setting up with a thrust button like this. We actually have the stock cam bolt machined down and a bronze bushing made so that it can ride against the back side of the timing cover. Now I've got the gasket on here in order to check the clearance, which we can do by placing a straight edge against it and then using feeler gauge and finding the distance we need in between there. I currently have do not have this fuel pump eccentric installed because it's actually uh, this is a used setup with this bushing so I actually need something a little bit thicker than the factory fuel pump eccentric and I'm not running the fuel pump centric anyway because it'll be an electric fuel pump because I have fuel injection on this engine. Now the this is about a hundred thousandths thick. When I checked with the feeler gauges I came up with a hundred and thirty seven as it is just like this and you could either go about this by running the stock fuel pump eccentric and then getting perhaps a what they call a machine shim which is just various thickness washers that are usually be had in five or ten thousandths increments and then you'd be able to set the thrust forward and rearward you'd probably want to shoot for something between six and fifteen thousandths is a good place to be it just allows a little bit of room for expansion and it's not holding all the parts tight against each other and that could be accomplished like if I if I ran the fuel pump centric plus a 30 thousandths machine washer I'd have seven thousandths of thrust clearance but the other option is I'm a machinist so I just made my own shim washer that will replace the fuel pump centric completely that I can then install behind this bolt and this at a th thickness of 130 will accomplish that same thing and give me seven thousandths of thrust clearance I always like to use red Loctite for anything related to the camshaft retention. Usually be quite generous with it. Uh, this is just purely to absolutely make sure it doesn't come loose because obviously should this bolt start backing out it's now going to be taking away any clearance we have. and. I mean, this doesn't matter what kind of engine it is, whether it's uh, the old the Chevy, Ford, even the import stuff that I've worked on there, I just, I don't trust the bolts to not back out, so it's always just a good little bit of extra safety precaution to make sure you got Loctite on those. Once you got the bolt in and torqued down, because of this, uh, button type setup. This is actually a wear surface on the inside. It's, I mean, because it's allowed to spin because it would be in contact with the timing cover. So we just want to add a little bit of assembly lube onto here to make sure that we don't have uh, anything running dry there before it can get splashed with oil on startup. Now I can come back and double check the thrust clearance just to be sure.
I can get the seventh thou to start in behind there pretty easy slides right in and the, the eighth thou is a little bit of a just it's pushing out on the straight edge just ever so slightly when it tries to go in there so now I know what my thrust clearance is and that's set and ready to go Having checked for the proper push rod length that I need to be using, I settled on uh, 8600 as the best length for what I need. So, we're going to put all these push rods in. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is just verify that they're all clean, which uh, if you just hold them up to the light and actually look through them to make sure that the oil holes are open on all of them, just to verify that's a good way to check. Um, this is important when you're getting oil to the top end through the push rods. There are some applications that don't have oil holes in the push rods, but uh, most of them do. So you need to know what you're working on that way. I've got a lot of these lifters just uh, set down in the block already. They're lubed up before I put them in, just with light oil. Um, you can use assembly lube as well. We're going to want to do the same things with the push rods. We'll just take oil and move up the, the ball ends a little bit on both sides because we're going to want to make sure there's lubrication. And then we can start putting them in. Now normally if I had the opportunity, I would take these rocker arms, especially if they're brand new, and then soak them in a bucket of oil. What this will do is make sure all the needle bearings get lubrication. These have been run in an engine before and they're already, I mean, they're still all oily to the touch. Plus, as I've said before, we'll be priming this engine quite a bit before we actually run it. So I'm not too worried about uh, them starting up dry, especially because they've been in an engine that ran before. So I'm just going to get all the rocker arms put on. There is a rounded edge and a flat edge. Obviously the, the flat recessed edge needs to go up so that the poly lock can push on that. If I was expecting this engine to end up sitting for quite a long time, I would be putting some assembly lube on the tips of the valves. Again, just make sure that there's some kind of lubrication that stays up there. This is less important with a roller tip rocker, but still a good practice. But as I said, I'll be priming this quite a bit because it'll be an external dry sump. We'll have like 12 quarts of oil in it, so we can just spin it over, make sure everything's fully lubricated before we even fire it. If you have a non dry if you have a wet sump application still that can be accomplished by driving the oil pump whether that's uh, usually below the distributor gear if you have an application like an LS uh, that is not an option because the oil pump is driven off of the crankshaft so in an application like that and many other newer engine brands as well are also like that you'll need to be aware of making sure that you get proper lubrication added to everything during the assembly process. I'm not running these poly locks all the way down because I'll want to make sure that uh, each lobe, cam lobe is on base circle when I set the rocker. This is a solid roller cam so there won't be just setting it down and giving it a quarter turn like you would with a hydraulic cam. So I'll need to make sure that each one's on base circle and then again take the feeler gauge, check the um, distance between the roller tip and the valve and that will be setting lash. We'll go over that here in a little bit. Now one of the best ways 
As far as setting lash or even preload when you're looking at a hydraulic cam application is to guarantee that your cam shaft is on base circle for each valve as you set each valve individually. There are some locations where you could set multiple cylinders at once but that also is in lieu of not having a large camshaft. And it's also not a guarantee, but one way to guarantee it, absolutely, is we will look for a valve to start moving. We'll just look focus on cylinder two here, which right now neither one of these has been moving while I'm rotating it, which means it's during the compression and power cycle. Now, as this valve, which is the exhaust, is just beginning to open. We know for an absolute fact that the intake valve will be closed then. And we can set the intake valve at this location. Then, we can keep turning it over and you can see the exhaust is closing, intake's opening, that's overlap. We can keep turning it and then now, just as the intake valve starts to close, we know that we're guaranteed to be having the exhaust on base circle and we can set the exhaust. So, I'll start at one end and I'm just going to go valve by valve, that way I don't skip around and lose track of where I'm at and I can just, one at a time, make sure that I'm getting it set right as I go. Now we're going to go about setting lash. You need your feeler gauge an Allen wrench that fits the set screws in the poly lock and a wrench that fits the poly lock. So wanting to go with 16 to 18 thousandths of lash on the intake side I'll start out with the 18 thou feeler gauge and I'll just put it under between the valve tip and the roller and I'm just going to tighten down the poly lock until I have enough tension on there that it actually just hangs there all by itself. I'll take the Allen wrench and we'll tighten up the set screw until it doesn't turn anymore by hand. That way we know we're hitting the top of that stud. Now I can take the wrench and the set screw and I'm going to back, off, back it off ever so slightly on the wrench and tighten up the set screw so that when I turn them together and they get tight we'll be able to maintain close to what our lash is. Well, the 18 comes out of there. It wasn't too difficult, but otherwise I can throw my 16 goes right in there. 17 goes in and it's got a little bit of tension on it. And the 18, the 18 I really got to push into there. So I'd, I'd say we're going to be, you know, 17 for sure. It could be an 8, I mean definitely 18 is still able to go in there without too much effort. So 18 is probably what we'll go with for same with that set at. Because if I go up to a 19, I'm guessing it's going to be much, yeah, a 19, I've really got to push on it to get it to go in there. So, 18's more of what the feel is for that gauge. And we know we're tight because it went with, you got to turn that Allen wrench and the wrench at the same time to jam against the top of that rocker stud. And that's what locks it down in place. So with that set, we'll want to move on and I try to go cylinder by cylinder just so I don't lose track of where I'm at. I don't want to be bouncing around all over the place. So the exhaust is opening right now because we had this set on the base circle for the intake. I'll rotate it over. The intake is now opening. And we hit peak and now the intake valve is closing and we'll set the exhaust. Since we want to be shoot for 20 to 22, I'll go about the same way I did the intake. I'll get the 22 to start with. We'll snug it down. Get back the set screw off a little bit. Snug it down by hand. It's hanging there. Run the set screw the rest of the way in. Get ready with both of them. Back the wrench off. Set screw. And tighten them together. So we're back to our 22. 
22 goes in there kind of easy, so it might not be tight enough. Yeah, because the 23 is what it goes in, 24 even goes in, so we're still too loose there. Now, I can, I maybe backed it off a little too much with the wrench, or I can try tightening them both up a little bit more, so we'll try that first. I don't want to go so much that I start risking stripping threads out or anything like that, so I'll be within reason. There, and now I really got to push to get the 22 to go in there. So we'll go back to a 20. And the 21, we'll start with the 20. 20 goes in there, it's got some light tension on it, that's pretty good. 21 is a lot more sticky, so I'd say we're set at 20 for that. Good to go. And I'll just continue on down and do the rest of them. Now with all these set, I should mention that the 16 to 18 for the lash on the intakes and the 20 to 22 for the lash on the exhaust would typically be a hot lash. Um, obviously, I can't have the engine totally warmed up and set this right now, so these, the valve covers will need to come back off once this thing gets running in a car or on a dyno to reset those. And being as we're using a hydraulic roller profile, I believe I was even recommended that I can run tighter than that by anywhere from five to ten thousandths, but again, that's something that I'd rather play with on the dyno, if it's possible, to get this on an engine dyno, because it'll be much easier for removing valve covers and stuff versus being a car, and then I'll be able to do back-to-back -back pulls to check and see whether or not adding that extra camshaft by tightening up the lash, because it will open the valve just a little bit sooner, is going to be of benefit or not. At this point we're ready to start putting the front timing cover on. This is an oil splash seal that Oldsmobile has. It goes on this way, which is all it does basically is see how much is in there when the balancer goes on and it just keeps the oil splash to a minimum directly on that front seal. But it still lets oil travel by to the front because it, uh, it's not tight to the timing cover. Normally there would be an oil deflector that would go in right here, which is to keep splash coming off of the chain from going up into the fill tube. Again, this is a dry sump engine, I'll just be plugging this because all the oil will be in a tank that's separate. Otherwise that stuff would be in for a wet sump application since I'm not using the fuel pump eccentric either. I'll need a block off plate for over here. And I don't need to worry about that right now because that installs from the outside. <clears throat> if I didn't mention it before, this oil galley plug right here has an open hole in it and that's for spraying onto the timing set itself and giving proper lubrication to the chain. So I can just quickly look down and double check that, yep, that's installed correctly and for sure. Uh, because this is a diesel block, it's just uh, MPT on both sides, so you got to be more aware of that. If it was a gas block, they have different size hex heads and threads, so you basically can't screw that up. Unless, of course, you threw them away when you took the engine apart, in which case, yeah, you need to find ones that actually fit. And one of the threads is common, the other one is not. So we'll need to get the gasket on here. I like to put a little gasket maker against the face and just against the face of the block so that we can glue the gasket on and then nothing on the outside. This makes that if we have to pull the timing cover back off ever that hopefully it won't damage the gasket and this is especially useful if something happens like say on an engine dyno and you gotta check something quick. It's easier to do that versus end up having to scrape a bunch of gasket and everything back off and I've had good luck with it and it's never leaked. Um, one thing before I forget though, I need to find pins to go in here because when I had my block dropped off they decided to pull those pins out. They didn't need to come out for cleaning but I need to find pins that will fit that again. So, And this is something that can be commonly overlooked on any engine. In fact I have a buddy who screwed up on this on a 4G63. He uh, took the dowel pins out or the machine shop took the dowel pins out and didn't put them back in 
and he constantly had front main seal leaks and that's because these two dowel pins are there to locate the timing cover and make sure that that oil seal is on center of the crankshaft. If you don't have these dowel pins in, you're going to have oil leaks because it's going to have the seal shifted and pushing too hard on one side and not enough pressure on the other and it will leak. Now when it comes to putting the timing cover on and tacking that gasket up, I like to use this uh, shellac, shellac, shellac stuff. The nice part about it is it's pretty tacky and it doesn't, it takes a while to dry so you can really just smear it on here, nice thin layer, you know, just like any other silicone stuff, you don't need a ton of it. You just want to get enough on here to cover all the surfaces. Also didn't have the correct dowels on hand so I had to run to the hardware store to get some dowels. You got to be careful if you're going to do that on any engine because such as the case here it is a 5 16 dowel hole and that's what size dowel it needs however when you're getting hardware store type stuff there can be of a harder material and therefore they can not compress like they would for the standard type of dowel pin that would go in an engine block and you can run the risk of cracking the casting if they're too tight I ran into that very problem where actually they wouldn't even fit through my timing cover so what I did was I just had mounted them in the drill and then took like a gasket remover type uh, grinding pad, one that looks like a bunch of intertangled stuff, you know, something to be really light grinding and just spun it into my drill and used one of the air grinders to run the other bit with the pad on it and then I was able to just very lightly skim cut until it just fit nicely inside of the timing cover and then I felt like it was small enough that I wouldn't run the risk of cracking the block putting it in, which is exactly how it worked out, so otherwise it was going to be several days wait to try to get the correct stuff and really all it is is a dang dowel pin the part that sucks is I have several other blocks here I could take them out of if I had a tool to remove them, but I don't so we got just that little bit of shellac on there to glue this gasket up and the nice part here is you can just kind of push it to it like I said it's tacky so this is what's nice about it is it'll hold your gasket in place and if you want to shift your gasket a little bit try to make it line up with the hole so it's not in the way of something later on it's easy to do that and at that point now we do want to put some pressure on here to get the gasket to firmly seat. Uh, normally be worried. I'd be worried about putting the water pump on with it. However, I do have the water pump, but it uh, needs to be modified yet. To actually, rather than using the aluminum nipple casting that's part of the water pump, I end up uh, putting uh, tapping for in, cutting it off and tapping for NPT fittings so I can run some AN lines for part of the cooling system. But Anyway, now that we got this ready, we know that our thrust is set, we got our splash shield on, we don't have to put in the deflector or anything here because we're just going to end up plugging that hole too. We can line this up and this is where those dowel pins are important because as you can see, it lines up the timing cover on both sides and that's what keeps the seal centered on the crankshaft. Just tip it back and forth here and you can see it's such a snug fit that that's really what holds it in place and there it drops down home. I've got some bolts that will just run in here and just snug them up and that way it'll let that gasket set up and seal with the timing cover and then later on I can 
to swap these bolts out, put the water pump on, put it on a timing pointer if I need to, or if I need to mount another bracket over here. All of that I can do at a later time, I don't have to do it right now. Otherwise it turns into you're juggling a lot of parts all at once to get this bolted up, which is not impossible to do, but like I said, I don't need to... I need the water pump off anyway, so there's really no point in putting it on just to take it back off later and modify it. I've got these flange head bolts just to spread out the load a little bit. Um, they're more of a factory style that way, but not entirely necessary either. I've done this with just a regular hex bolt before. All I'm worried about is pulling it down tight. We don't need to crank it down and torque it up. I just want to have it where that gasket is pushing tight into that shellac and then it can dry with pressure on it. Another thing this allows me to do is allows me to have this front seal area so I can, the oil pan can be installed as well now. Now that I've got the valve train adjusted and timing cover on, it's time to start sealing this engine up. So I've got these valve covers left over from another engine build from a few years ago. So I'll be using those because I haven't got anything else that'll clear these rockers at the moment. Uh, stock style might be able to, but they make spacer rails if you're trying to run a stock style valve cover. Or there's some um, other aftermarket options, but this is one of them. Uh, they just happen to have them around. They're a nice cast iron piece from GM, but they're also uh, heavy. Actually, I weigh them. They're seven pounds a piece. But, they'll look nice on here. If you're running them in an Oldsmobile car, you'll have to be concerned about uh, whether or not you're still running a brake booster because they will be in the way back here. I'm already looking at possibly moving a bunch of stuff around in the race car, so shouldn't be a big deal, or I can always uh, go back to a stock style and get a rail spacer later on. But for now, I want to get these on. I want to try to get as much of the engine sealed up as I can and get it closer to being done already. I've also got these uh, super nice o-ring plastic style gaskets. Again, left over from years ago. I honestly don't know if you can even get these things anymore. Um, the Felpro used to make them. Um, I don't know if they quit. If they still do make them, the number's uh, 13403T. Um, as far as I know, they quit making them like eight years ago or something like that. But And these were used on another engine as well, so I'm just going to wipe them off. And they're completely reusable, which was the nice thing about them. This here is usually the dipstick hole on an Oldsmobile, be on the driver's side. I have just uh, ran a tap for eighth inch uh, NPT and put a pipe plug in there and I just tapped it enough there that I could get the plug to thread in and bottom out. It's not a perfect size for the threads, but it's a good way to plug it if you need to plug it. 
Some guys will go to an aftermarket dipstick in here, which requires a quarter inch MPT. In which case, uh, if you do plan ahead for that, you can just drill from the pan side before any assembly or anything is done, and preferably before you even clean the block for final assembly. And you can just drill that out to 7 16 and then tap it from the top with a, you know, an extension and a socket. And then you can thread in any number of aftermarket dipsticks. Now I've gone out and rechecked a lot of my parts for this dry sump setup. I actually don't have to make a block off plate for the fuel pump here because I actually made a mount location off of that for the dry sump because the dry sump pump will sit right here. So that's already taken care of. I'd forgotten I hadn't put the freeze plugs in yet so I just got those ordered. Uh, they're easy enough to put in later on in the stages like this. Um, I was talking earlier about in the previous video about capping off this uh, pump face here for the, where the oil pump normally goes. Uh, now that just pumps fluid down and then out this portion of the block into what would be the factory oil filter housing. I'm actually not using that because I'll have a remote mount oil filter so the plate that I ended up making for this that actually has the feed tube because I need to feed oil into the block here still doesn't have anything there it actually just caps it off so I'm not worried about making a block off plate for up here because it's literally just going to be open air space in there and if a little oil splashes up into there it's not going to hurt anything and it's certainly not going to leak around the outside here because I'll just smear some uh, gasket maker around to make that fit. Now when it comes to putting the oil pan on, there's a couple of key areas that we need to focus on making sure we get sealed up, most notably the corners on each end, where we have a rubber seal that covers the arc area, and then we go transition to the cork gasket. Some engines will have a one piece, which is really nice. You still need to dab a little bit of silicone in the corners where it might leak. Because we have basically four pieces, for how this is going to work out, I'll be putting some in the corners there as on the bottom side as well as putting it on the top side before we put the pan on. I'm going to glue the pan gasket rails to the block instead of the pan. That way if the pan has to come off, hopefully the gaskets stay put and we don't have to worry about scraping it loose off of the, the pan or anything like that. We just want to glue one side down to hold in place and then it'll seal up with the bolts. Now since we've been assembling this, this rail is all covered in oil right now. So we get our brake cleaner. And we're just going to wipe down the rails. They need to be clean and dry to get any of that gasket maker to stick. And like I said, in these problem areas, we want to try to get into the corners too. As well, and underneath this timing cover lip a little bit. So I want to make sure everything's wiped down and clean. You've probably heard me say that so many times now already in the last two videos is clean, clean, clean. It's actually that important. <laughs> Can't remember who put it out, but it was somebody that it was some of the educational videos and things we were looking at when I was going to school for this stuff. They put it out. They said the number one killer of a fresh rebuilt engine is dirt and debris that got into it during the assembly process or was rather not cleaned out. So everything you can do to make sure that the engine is going to be as clean as possible is worth your time to do. Now for an Oldsmobile and most engines for that matter there's a front seal, a back seal, and then a left and a right pan side. For an Oldsmobile you got the key difference is the little bump for the dipstick so that'll go on the driver's side and you can lay that down and line it up and we're just going to double check make sure we got everything laid where it needs to be 
the front seal is bigger and it's got this locator stud for a hole that's in the timing cover to help locate it. And the rear's got the kick downs here that drop into the between the block and the rear cap. So we're going to start with the seals on the ends. I'm going to start with, now that everything's dry to the touch, putting a dab of silicone in the corner here and down in the base at the rear area. All the way around. Now we're not doing nothing crazy. It's just a little bit there, so that's going to be able to be pushed down by the top seal and the rail seal will go sideways into that. At the rear here, same thing. We're just putting it in there where we'll be able to squish out and make sure we're getting that bottom groove area right here sealed up. I can take my front seal line it up in the hole and then just press it in as we go and the rear you can just start on one side push it in get the other side in and then press it down and I can see that it's bubbled out the silicone a little bit so I know it's just pushed and filled that space in now we can just lift the corners up on the front seal here a little bit and I can start laying in a bead and I'm going to go on the inside of all the bolt holes for this small bead of silicone. That way we're not running the risk of making a leak to the bolt hole and then leaking outside the block. And like I said before, you don't need a ton of silicone on here. Excessive silicone just cause problems. And now I'm going to come back. I'm just going to take my finger and I'm going to smear it out into a smaller, wider area. If I gotta get that seal up out of the way a little bit smeared in there better, I will. Actually probably should have started with the pan rails. It's been a while since I put one of these. It's been well, it's been since two years since I've had the other engine apart. <laughs> I'm gonna take my pan rail gasket. You can see this notch is for going on both sides of this front lip of that timing cover in the front and then this tab on the back is for going on top of the rear gasket or rear seal here so we will start getting that pushed in and then I can just line up the holes and lay it down as I go and I'm just pressing down lightly to get it to start contacting that silicone we get to the back because it goes on top I'll have to put a little bit of silicone on top of that in that little groove area and I'll put a little more around the edge too just to make sure because that's one of those weird spots where it's going to be going for, you know, stepping around the ga different layers of gaskets and there might end up being an air pocket in there because they obviously don't fit all perfect together.
And if you run into any areas where your silicone line mixes, it, just, just lift the gasket back up and put some more in there or smear it over to where it's going to actually do its job sealing. Oh, excuse me. It's a lot easier to fix that now versus having to get this in a car and then find out that it's got a leak and then you got to fix it in the car. I can finish pushing this front seal back down in the corners. So now, in the back, the gasket's on top of here, but on the front, it's on top of this gasket. So I'll put another bead of silicone around here just to seal up that area because that's going to be one of the goofy ones. I'll just show you a little closer what those corners are like. Oh, we're going to put a little more on here. Get up the side of it a little bit. These corners are about the only place where I'm willing to go perhaps a little bit excessive on the silicone. And as it should make sense by now, by a little bit excessive, I mean like, okay, I'm going to have enough there to make sure it's going to do the job that I want. And then maybe just a little extra. We're still not piling a huge freaking bead on here for any reason. So I've got my modified oil pan that I made for a dry sump setup ready to go. I just wiped down the rail areas and the inside quick with some more brake cleaner just uh, as a final cleaning giving it a second to dry here and now I'll just double check that you know, everything looks like it's good to go and then I can Set the pan down on here. You can see it's kind of like sprung up a bit, and that's just from that front seal. It actually gets, or and, and rear seal, they get quite a bit of pressure on them. I find it easiest to try to get the front and rear corner bolts started first just to help keep the alignment going and then you might have to push down on it a bit to get some threads going there we got both of these sides so we can push over Try to get the other two started. take my time and try to draw this down evenly because we don't want to tweak it a whole bunch and go past where it'll end up because then if our silicone pushes completely out in one corner we might end up creating a leak for ourselves but Let's take your time. Now I just got these snug down. I have just a you know a bit of excess silicone that is squirted out of here. Hopefully I don't have any more than that sticking out the inside. We I mean that's the big thing. We don't want chunks of silicone ending up in the engine. Um, this is a bit much, but it was also 
for the seal area forward, I didn't put, I put less on the inside edge than I did on the outside edge, so now we can wipe it off for the outside edge. But before I get all the all that torque down, I want to get the rest of these bolts started. Just in case we gotta loosen them up a little bit again so we can have some more wiggle room. Flange head type bolts are usually nice to use for this kind of stuff because this is just thin sheet metal. So it helps spread out the load a little bit. Actually for Oldsmobile the factory ones are flange head. And then, rather than clean up some 40 plus year old bolts, these are just new ones. I got them from McMaster Car. You can usually buy them in bulk pretty cheap. I mean, it's hardly worth the time of cleaning up the old stuff. There, I got all of them started. Had to use one of the other bits here as a little bit of a pry bar to get the hole started. So now I'll start in the center. And I'll just run these till they're snug. I mean, if you can, if you can just. Use your extension as more like a screwdriver, is about all the tension you want to put on the first go around. And we're just going in a circular outboard spiral. That's usually how most bolt sequences work on just about anything be it an oil pan, uh, heads, intake manifold and that's just to keep from torquing down the ends and then having a bow in the middle that you can't really squeeze out of it versus if you go from the middle you can kit that down and then any excess distance can push out as you continue to tighten or at least I think that's the theory yeah, that's also why we didn't want to torque down the outside ones completely all the way right off the bat but since they're the larger thread they're the easiest to get started and closest to the seals where the problem is with that tension now, much like the valve cover bolts, these are small threads, they don't have to be terrible. I'm only going to hold it here as far as tightening them up. I'm sure there's a torque spec if you're that kind of person that wants to do all that business. I mean really it's a quarter inch bolt so it ain't going to be a whole hell of a lot of torque anyway. That's why I'm just gluten tightening it. <laughs> Now at this point, if I had an inch-pound torque wrench to go around and do all these quarter-inch stuff, this would be the time to do it now that everything's snugged up. I'm just going to go through the whole sequence again, because I mean, once you start tightening and you go out in the outspire pattern, you'll have tightened everything down enough where the center ones are probably loose again. Is there second time around? They're nice and tight still. I right, just finish off the ends.
And these ones I might give just a little bit extra because they are a larger thread and they have to deal with that seal on both ends. We're good. Now, because I like to be a little more cleanly about this, because, you know, every little bit of visual makes a difference. I'm going to wipe off that excess silicone on each end. Just makes for a more professional looking job. Now, if you really wanted to get fancy, you could even come in here and cut this tab off at the end, because really all it is is there for the alignment. I'm going to go over something that's often overlooked in engine building, and that is port matching the intake manifold. Uh, if we're good at that, we're going to need a set of gaskets and your intake manifold of choice. The reason for this is typically with a cast manifold, how it comes is your port sizes are going to be smaller than that of the head. That is to not cause any ledges on the way into the engine as air flows due to small differences in alignment because if you deck ahead it lowers the ports or if the intake manifold's a little wide or narrow or whatever it can move the relationship of the two ports together. However, it is well worthwhile to match them up at least on the sides and the roof. You don't really have to on the floor and having a little ledge there as long as it's a step into the head as in the intake manifold is smaller still than the cylinder head opening that can actually act as an anti-reversion dam and it's not going to affect performance a whole lot because it's actually a fairly slow part of the port as far as airspeed goes so we are definitely more worried about the sides and the roof getting them matched up. In some cases, intakes will come extra small as they're meant to be ported. As you can see here, there's a big difference as far as the gasket to the intake manifold on this particular intake manifold. And the reason for that is, is the heads and the gasket are a big block Oldsmobile port, and this is a small block manifold. Now, this manifold is cast with the intention of having all that extra material to be able to pour it out of here to match up to the larger heads. For materials you'll need, you'll need some painter's tape or even scotch tape can work and a sharpie. Preferably a fine tip point that'll help with your alignment. Now we're just going to want to get a couple pieces of tape pulled out and laid against the gasket. It really doesn't matter where they are as long as they're not in the way of the ports themselves. And what we're going to want to do is we're going to line up the gasket to where it has its best fit to the ports in the head. Typically, you might end up having a little bit of misalignment, but everything's kind of a give and take. After all, these are castings. They're not perfect. If you have a CNC set of heads, it might be a lot more, it'll be a lot more accurate because typically they'll be fit to a certain gasket, in which case you should be using that gasket number. So I'm just feeling in here, I want to make sure that the roof area is lined up nice and smooth with that gasket. Like I said, that's the more important part of it because that's where you have high speed air at compared to the floor. The reason for that is, is the air will be entering at the top at the carb flange and it'll be trying to go path of, not path of least resistance, but that's also the shortest distance. So when it comes in, it's going to stick to the upper edge of the runner in the intake manifold, and that means it'll be also in the upper edge as it goes into the head, at which point it starts to cross over and drop down towards the valve. So this area of both the intake manifold and the head are relatively slow airspeed by comparison.
Once you've got the gasket set in place, you can add a couple more pieces of tape just to really make sure that it's not going to move anywhere. Um, you know, we want them to stay in location because when we set the intake manifold on, if it gets disturbed, it's going to throw all your marks off. Now, if your heads have been milled and your intake needs milling as well to get the bolt holes to line up, you need to do that ahead of time. I have already done that. The surface has been recut. The heads were cut 60, so I ended up cutting 100 off of the intake and it fits good. I checked it earlier. So I'm just going to set it down where I can get the four outermost bolts started. This is just to aid in the alignment and make sure that I have the intake manifold in the correct place because if I don't then uh, we're going to run into problems later on. The key here is to have repeatability. We don't want to go marking the gasket transferring that to the intake, porting that out, and then not having everything line up later on. I'm not actually going to torque any of these down, I'm just running these bolts down finger tight. Now as you can see we've got some gasket poking out around the ends of the intake manifold at all four corners. We can use this to make a, a drawing line to show the alignment there. We'll also be making some hash marks both uh, vertically and horizontally for placement. This is so that when we pull the intake manifold back off, we can then tape the gaskets to the intake in the correct place. This is why that fine point sharpie works nice, is I can actually just trace it. You ain't got to do the whole thing, but just to do the ends to make sure that those are lined up makes it pretty easy. And since I have enough gasket to trace that it actually worked out pretty well, if you were going to do hash marks on it, it would be a matter of drawing two lines that would then line up with each other. But actually this fine point got right down into the corner really well. Like, I don't even see any bit of a gap at all to the manifold from the gasket as far as where the sharpie touched so all we know is we gotta line it up just so that uh, any unsharpied portion disappears. One other thing that's good to verify before you mark everything is also that you have an even gap here across the intake manifold and the block that shows you that you don't have the intake tweaked one way or another I had actually checked this yesterday just to be sure, so that's why I didn't mention it earlier. Now with the intake manifold back off, I don't want to get the gaskets mixed up side to side. So I'm just going to take that Sharpie and I'm going to put uh, somewhere where I can see it. Enough overhang, I'm going to put a D on this side for drivers. And I'll put a... P on this one for passenger side. And it's outside my line mark so when I put it and tape it to the intake I will be able to verify that I got them in the correct place. Now I don't have the issue with these gaskets because the ports are almost a perfect match. I mean there's a little bit of misalignment where there's just an edge here that's okay, otherwise, I mean, this one's pretty much smooth all the way around. There might be just a edge on the, the floor there. If your gaskets are larger than the head opening, you will need to 
either die cam the head and then scribe the port location because if, for example, this edge here had an eighth inch of stick out, you know, where the port was smaller than the gasket, you would want to know that so that when you transfer this gasket to the intake, you can leave that eighth inch on that side because you don't want to open the intake manifold up larger than the head and then have a step going into the head because that will create turbulence in basically it ends up being a big uh, air block as far as the keeping the airflow smooth it's not great all right now i got my driver's side gasket and i'm gonna put it on the driver's side of the manifold so looking at my lines there what i'm gonna want to do is i'm gonna line it up in the exact position that it was on the engine. So I'll just get it to where that Sharpie mark is consistent all the way around. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to tape it to the intake manifold. That way we can flip it over and see where the port lands on the manifold itself. So now with the lines matched up on both ends, this is where the gasket is sitting. And as you can see, I got quite a bit of material to take off of the roof area of the runners. Car flange is there. And that's to match up to the big block gasket. You can see the ports line up pretty close on some of the sides some of the other sides not so much and that's just what's inherent with a cast manifold I mean you can't make everything absolutely perfect every time so that's why ports are cast a little to the small side that way when it lands on the head it's not making that step that blocks airflow so, what I can do here is I can die cam the head, I can take this gasket back off, I can die cam the head out, and then I can scribe that, and then I'll have a line that I can go up to, I don't want to go past, and actually to be safe, I'll probably leave about a sixteenth, or maybe a thirty-second off of the line, just to give me a little bit of wiggle room front to back and up and down, because when you torque the intake down it'll squish a few thousandths into the gasket it might shift it ever so slightly I mean really it's got to be a sixteenth or more to really make an impedance to airflow but we want to be as close as we can without actually being too large so it's better to err a little bit on the small side on the intake than to go too big because the step is far more detrimental when it's on the way into the engine versus being an anti-reversion step otherwise and like I talked about for the anti-reversion step there these floor areas down here there's quite a bit of material hanging up there but actually I really don't need to touch that whatsoever like I said that's the slow area of the port I mean it's kind of a substantial step but it's not enough that I'm worried about it's going to be cutting off airflow so I'm actually going to leave these floors alone and I'm just going to worry about the sides and the roof all right now that we're on the garage here we got a little more light I'm going to use this steel blue die cam uh, just a bunch of different brands or whatever. It's just a transfer die that then can be scribed so you know where your port is at. Additionally, that uh, sharp tip 
Sharpie could do the job as well. Um, I just like this stuff because it stays put a little more in the ink and accidentally rub it off like you could a Sharpie. So we're just going to get a little bit going here. And I'm just going to draw it around the ports. Not really anything to it. We're just wanting to get enough on there that we'll be able to see our lines. So I know I don't need a ton on the sides, but I definitely need more along the roof of the port area. Don't have to quite go quite as all the way, but and then we just gotta let it dry. Should only take a couple minutes. Now with my gasket tape back on there, I got my scribe line or sharpie line lined up all the way around. Just got to double check it a little bit. Once I'm happy with where that's at, I can flip it over and now you can see where the die cam has ended up. And I'm going to want to add some more tape just to keep it in place. The last thing we want to do is be trying to scribe this and then have it shift around and get all kinds of crooked lines and off-center. Good. I think we could add a couple more pieces of tape right to the top of these ports. Gasket seems to be held in place pretty good. Now I'll take my scribe tool and I'm just going to trace it. I'm not going to put a ton of pressure up against the gasket because, like I said, I don't want to shift it at all. And you got to be careful of it lifting up. And if you got to go over it a couple of extra times just to make sure you have a good line all the way around, then do it because it's not hard to do it at this point. But if you grind up close to that line and then lose track of it, it'll be much harder to deal with later on. Oh, well, I'll check my lineup lines on the other side. Everything still looks good. All right, now I can take the gasket back off. And now you can see how easy that line is to tell where that gasket opening is at. So like I said, we won't, I'm not gonna worry about this little bit down here at the floor. Uh, it's maybe a little over an eighth inch at the most, um, but we got probably 3 16 or better on the side we can open up as well as this, uh, it's gotta be 5 16 of an inch, we can raise the roof up. Now to open this intake manifold up, I like to use an air grinder, especially an extended one. It gives you a lot more uh, stability and control. Um, I prefer the air over an electric just because they're able to have a lot more uh, speed control unless you have a really good electric one that can have like a rheostat set up so that you can control the speed. Um, I've never had a super expensive one to know how good they can be, but uh, air seems to be real well with being able to go from quite slow to full speed. Uh, I will use this large 
oval, I think this is a flame, flame shape cutter to rough a lot of it in, especially this roof area because I got to dig it down but I also want to keep it quite flat. So this will be able to cut and keep a fairly flat shape as it goes. After that I may switch to this oval depending on how I need to go with uh, corners or just how things happen to fit in there. If when I get down to coming up to the line for finishing touches I may switch to a double cut over the single cut. Uh, typically the double cut is for cast iron but when used on aluminum with an, uh, with proper uh, lubrication there it'll keep it from gumming up and it'll actually be a slower cut. After that I'll go to cartridge roll just to smooth out the bumps of the burrs although honestly the Burr finish, especially with the double cut, won't be much different than the cast. So really the sand rolls will be just knock down high spots and make a uniform finish. After that I'll chase it with uh, flapper paper. Uh, this is just the mandrel for a uh, roll of sandpaper slips in here and then you can just spin it around and coil up and make a roll as big as you want. That's really good because it doesn't have a solid surface like the cartridge roll. It'll actually just kind of drag across the surface and it's really good at just uniforming out the surface and again polishing off any high spots as you go. Now that we've got the intake manifold port matched, we're ready to install the intake. After all that grinding, I've gone in and sprayed brake cleaner through it and wiped it out to make sure I don't have any dust or debris in there. I also spent a little time just cleaning up the radius in the plenum as well. Now, the nice part about how we went about pour matching that is now our gaskets still have those marks on them so we can line everything back up. And I had them marked for passenger side, driver side. Now, to go about putting the gaskets on, I just want to use a little bit of gasket maker around the coolant ports on the intake manifold and I'll run a smear of it real thin along the bottom just to seal off any leakage up into the ports from the valley. So after all this is a dry sump engine we'll be pulling quite a bit of vacuum on the inside and I don't want to have a leak where suddenly now I'm pulling air and fuel out of a port and into the crankcase. We're just going to use gasket maker to go across the end rails on each side. I know I have a quite a small gap, maybe it's less than an eighth inch by the looks of it. So if I put a, about a 3 16 bead across both rails, I know for sure that we'll have a good seal on the end. Typically some engines will come with those rubber seals. I always throw those things right in the trash. Put the intake on, or set the intake on with the gaskets, see what that gap looks like, and then put a generous bead of sil gasket maker or silicone across there in order to actually seal up the end rails and be leak free. Just going to give everything a quick wipe down with brake cleaner again. This ensures that as it dries off here, that our gasket maker is going to have a good surface to adhere to. And I need to scrub a little paint off of these rail end rails as well. I'm going to start with getting the gaskets set in place. But because of how close they come down to the bottom rail of the head here, I'm going to make sure I get into these corners first. So we can just get a bead going. We're going to fill up that groove right between the head and the end rail just to make absolutely sure that we're going to have that sealed up. We don't want any air leaks or oil leaks coming from there. Now I'll put a quick smear around the water ports. And 
and down the bottom of the rail. Now, we don't want just a ton of this here, so I'm going to take my finger and I'm going to smooth all this out, spread it out nice and thin. Last thing we want is a big old bead that's going to push itself up and start blocking a port, whether that's coolant or intake, neither one would be good. I've put on just enough gasket maker to really just kind of push it out and make a seal that there ain't going to be so much there that when it bolts down it's going to squish and ooze out everywhere. Now I can take my gaskets and I can set them in place. You're going to take extra care to line up the ports. So that gasket maker will help to kind of tack them in place and hold them so that they don't shift when we put our intake manifold on. And we want to make sure that the gasket isn't shifted and blocking a port itself either. Just apply a little bit of pressure along where that gasket maker is at and that will help make sure that what little bit it's going to spread gets spread and it really just kind of tacks and holds them in place. If you remember before when I was trying to lay these up I had to tape them in place because they just kept sliding off. Now I don't even have to touch them they stay put. So. Now if I had a different style of gasket that didn't have these extra little rubberized sealing rings on them, I would then put a little bit of silicone around the water ports again before putting the intake on. However, these nice little rubber sealing rings on these Philpro gaskets will do the sealing on the intake side, plus I'll be able to put it on and remove it if need be, and it shouldn't destroy the gaskets. Because with the gaskets and the gasket maker underneath them gluing them to the head, they stay, should stay nice and put. If I ever have to pull the intake for some reason. <clears throat> now I'm ready to put the bead along the end rails. Yeah, I'm just going to try to put the bead along the center of the rail. That way when it squishes out it has room to the front and the back without becoming a big old thing hanging off of one edge. Worst of all, into the engine where it can get sucked up and block one of my oil pickup tubes or even if it fell all the way in the pan on a wet sump engine and blocked something there I mean either way it's not good And if you ever put a bead across like this and you're not sure it's enough, you can always just stack another thin one across the top. I think I'm pretty good, but you know, this is one spot where silicone never hurts too much. Well, I should stop saying silicone. Gasket maker. You don't want to use just like regular old silicone that's not 
made for engines. And it's actually easier to then stack this on top as well. Because you can have a fat bead on the bottom and then just put a thin skinny one across the top. And then when you put the intake manifold on, it'll actually just squish that all into one. So, there you go. You want to make sure you got enough in the corners again. Make sure that those are filled up. Double check my port line up. The gaskets look good. We also have our lines marked out so we know where our intake manifold is going to land. And just line up a bolt hole and eyeball it on the way in. Set it down nice and easy. Verify that I got some squish out of that silicone all the way around. Yep, and that means we're going to have a good positive seal there. Now I can get some bolts started. And I've got stainless steel bolts here, mostly just because for looks and it's easy. I like the, the smaller wrenching heads that come on the RPs. Say use anti-seize on these things all the time. So I just got a little anti-seize here in this stick. So I'll just put a little on there quick. Before I get any of the bolts screwed down too far, I can look at my gasket alignment has moved ever so slightly. So I want to look down through the intake and verify that the gaskets haven't moved on the head at least, because we definitely want to, I mean, that's where they're aligned up with the ports. And the intake manifold should pull down to it. This is Definitely a single plane manifold kind of a thing. The bigger it is, the easier it is to tell. And even though my lines here ain't quite perfect right now, although I can tell this side creeped down a little bit. So, see if I can shift that gasket up a little bit. There we go. Yeah, if you're doing anything with dual planes, you kind of just got to hope for the best because you really can't see what the alignment looks like after the fact. Most importantly here, I'm looking at the how the, the roof alignment is. Because that's, like we discussed before, where the high speed air is. So I definitely don't want gasket hanging down and blocking that at all. My alignment looks pretty good now. So I can finish snugging up these bolts. I'm just running them down finger tight for right now. And I'll get the centers going. Alright, now I got my gaskets lined up, the intake, all the bolts are snug down hand tight. So now I'm going to start snugging them up. Usually there's a torque spec for this kind of thing, but the hard thing with a lot of aftermarket manifolds is now you can't get a socket and a torque wrench down in here. I've never had too much issue with not having exact torque 
on it. Well, the times they'll just, uh, I mean, these are 3 8 bolts, so I know they can take um, any force I'm going to be able to put into it with this wrench without breaking. Um, but we're probably looking at a torque of around 30 ish foot pounds if it was specced out. I just know that I can find something that feels somewhere about that and then just make them all even. And you really just, unless you got some kind of crazy waddle joint thing and extension that you can trust, fine, but I've never had an issue with just doing them by hand. So, I want to start out and I want to snug it. I'm just using two fingers here to kind of push it. I'm going to do that one. I'm going to jump over, do the kitty corner opposite one, and then start my spiral. The spiral is just what the torque sequence would be. I don't want an old spiel. It just starts in the middle and then it just goes out even on the factory stuff. So if I start here and then go over here and then just keep bouncing around and then that's the whole works of it. And already, I mean, just with that little bit of, you know, pulling on the wrench lightly, it's already made this bolt loose again. And we'll just keep going through that until they all stay tight. I'm going to switch wrenches to one that's got a little step in it. Makes it a little bit easier, especially clear this valve cover. I'm moving around the engine now so that when I'm pulling my torque into these bolts, I'm doing it with the same standing, I don't know, position, if you will, with my arm. That helps me make sure that I'm getting them as even as possible for just having feel. But by all means, if you're able to get a torque wrench, use a torque wrench. Okay. Now our intake manifold's on. Uh, the gasket maker I used um, is ultra black. Right stuff would also be a good one. I know the right stuff sets up a lot quicker. Um, I'm not in a hurry of like if I was doing something that I expected to run today I'd be using the right stuff because it sets up in like an hour I think and this uh, Permatex Ultra Black takes 24 hours which I don't have to worry about oh. now since I've got a little bit of my excess silicone if you really care about it you can get in there and you can kind of wipe the excess off and smooth it out. Sometimes it's easy to get to, sometimes not so much. Um, I'm just going to leave it. I, I mean, I have a, a bit of a bead coming out of there, but I'd rather not start uh, smearing pushing on it and try and accidentally push any into the inside of the engine either. And honestly, by the time there's a water pump and water neck and all the other stuff on the front of this engine. I mean, nobody's going to really care enough to notice it anyway. Oh, that's the intake manifold on.